Let me make a bold statement, then I'm going to back it up with some stuff. Uh, the, the economy, U.S. economy is going to hell in a handbasket. And I can show you that in using just six numbers. Uh, but a lot of times people don't understand the, the ideology, the, the background behind this. So, you know, going to hell in a handbasket is a phrase that people use that a lot of people don't know what it means. So let me take you back in time. We're going back to early California, 1840s, late 1840s. California is not yet a state. Uh, it is a, basically a province of Mexico, half claimed by the United States, half claimed by the Mexican government, which is now independent from Spain. We have just discovered here in Northern California, uh, gold. It's become over the last couple of years, a, a real deal. People have been coming from all over the world to mine gold. And primarily the, the heavy mining, the heavy portion of all of that work was done by imported Chinese laborers. They brought basically slaves in from China and they had them do the, the hard pick and ax work, the hard drilling in the ground. Uh, and a lot of times what they did was drill holes in the sides of mountains and uh, large enough holes that they could put a man in there. They literally would take one of these Chinese laborers with a big pile of dynamite and they would send them in a basket, a small woven basket down the hole with instructions to when they got to the bottom of it, they were to light the dynamite and then get the heck out of there. And they were taken, they were pulled back out by other laborers. Unfortunately, a lot of times, uh, the other laborers were so scared that they were standing on top and that it would take too long to bring the man in the hole back out, they would run and the guy in the hole, probably 50% of the time was killed in the explosion. Uh, and that became known as going to hell in a handbasket. You're gonna go down that hole and you may not come back up. If you look at Merriam's Webster dictionary today, uh, it's defined as a situation that's rapidly deteriorating or uh, that you are set firmly on a course for your own destruction and that's what I'm saying, the U.S. government is putting us in a position, that's what we're headed for. Now, let me tell you about the six numbers that can back this up. Uh, there, there are six things that you guys need to be aware of. We'll kind of walk down through them slowly, and I'll explain how they're important. Uh, number one, we always hear about the U.S. debt. This is the largest number we're going to talk about. The debt is essentially the amount of money that the U.S. government has collectively over the years has overspent. In other words, money that they didn't have, they never received, but they borrowed from various sources and they, they overdrafted their checking account. And that number uh, is currently at $32.16 trillion. The ceiling is, I think, $33 trillion. That ceiling is, ex is expected to hit. Uh, we're going to hit that ceiling sometime between now and the end of June this year. And I, you, can't be, you can't go beyond that. Constitutionally, has been uh, already adjudicated that you're not, you can't just raise that limit arbitrarily. No emergency can do that. No, there's no way you can do beyond that. It has to be passed by Congress. Uh, it is not likely to be increased uh, because of the Republicans controlling the House of Representatives. Now they will increase it, but only if it's matched by accompanying uh, relief, the relief coming in the form of reduced expenses uh, in, in the budget. So. I don't expect you're going to see that thing happen. We saw this happen one time before in the Reagan administration where he refused to sign off on a new budget, forced the government to shut down. They had to let a lot of government employees go, that type of thing. Unfortunately, now the biggest expense is not employees. It's not Social Security. It's not even defense spending like it was during the Reagan administration. It's paying the interest on our debt. It's paying the interest on that 30 three trillion dollars approximately just to give you a sense of how big that number is because it sounds like a big number but you really don't know it until you look at it the gross domestic product the gdp of our entire nation in other words the value of all goods and services the top line the sales number of everything we make everything we provide everything we sell which basically includes all the paychecks everybody in the united states gets is only 25 trillion dollars a year so in other words if they took the entire year's everything and you paid the cost of goods sold yourself you paid your own all your own expenses but they took all of your top line all your salaries all of everything every every uh business sold it's only 25 trillion dollars there's not enough in a single year of taking everything from everybody to even pay off that deficit that or debt they call it the ceiling the debt ceiling 20 uh, 33 trillion dollars so that's problem number one is our debt deficit or our deficit spending more likely 
is just out of control. We've spent too many years uh, writing kites, kite checks, bad checks, you know, bounce and rubber checks type thing. And the only reason we can back that up is because the government has the ability to print money and then sell those money in the forms of T-bills, bonds, and notes. They can sell that to the general public, and that includes the nation of China, the nation of Russia, and several other nations that over the years have provided uh, the biggest source of supply of money. So in other words, we print T-bills, Chinese would buy them. We print T-bonds, the Russians would buy them. And, and that's basically how we ended up getting our money. Now the problem is, once again, you've got to go to Congress to get approval to do those things. The Treasury has certain levels of authority that they can use uh, in order to get that, but that is a, that's a problem in and of itself, okay? That's, that's number two. Number three, the total deposits, that's the money on deposit in all the banks in the U.S. That's my money, your money, and uh, AT&T's money, and Ford's money, and IBM's money, and Microsoft. All the deposits for all the companies and all the individuals in the U.S. is $17 trillion. So not enough there. If you took all the money out of all the bank accounts, there's not enough here. On top of that, of the $17 trillion, $7 trillion is not covered by FDIC. In other words, it's uninsured deposits. This is what happened at Silicon Valley Bank, SVB, a couple of weeks ago when they went broke. They had a huge amount of their deposits were above the $250,000 limit. And there was all this social media flurry about the bank was going out of business, whether they were or they won't, they did. Uh, and everybody ran to the bank, it was an old fashioned bank run, and they wanted their money out. Now. If it was like it was on This Is a Wonderful Life uh, back in the 1930s or 40s when they made this movie and, you know, they'd go up to the counter and ask George Bailey, you know, I just need $25 to get by and all that, leave the rest of the $200 in there. That's not what happened. People uh, had, you know, windows on their own computers. They could take their own money out. And the smart ones, the big ones, the, the folks that had billions in there were the first ones that took their money out. In fact, about a billion dollars was withdrawn just in the first few minutes of that bank run. And overall, there was enough pulled out that the bank had to sell the T-bills, bonds, and notes that they were holding at a deep discount to come up with cash to pay all of those depositors who were asking for their money. Now, remember, the bank's obligated to pay the whole thing, uh, not just the, the $10 trillion that is insured, but the whole thing, the whole $17 trillion. Um, and you know, within minutes, the FDIC had to come in and seize the bank and shut them down because they were out of business. They sold, they had to sell all their assets, all of their stock, all of the bonds, all the things they held of the US governments at a discount, and they were upside down. They technically had no more solvency. They were negative net worth. And that brings us to the last two numbers. And this is where the big problem is. The banks today have a total net worth, equity, whatever you want to call it, their value is $2.1 trillion, 2.1 trillion. So that's what the banks are collectively worth. That's B of A, Wells Fargo, Silicon Valley Bank, all the banks in the United States have a net equity, a balance sheet net worth of $2.1 trillion. Unfortunately, they also have $1.7 trillion of unrealized losses. Now, banks have a different type of accounting than the rest of us do. If you invest in stocks, you know how the deal works. At the end of the year, you've got like a true up period where you go calculate how much you made or lost, and then you report that on your tax return. Even if you didn't liquidate that asset, you have to pay tax on the value at the end of the year. The banks don't have to do that. The banks don't do what's called mark to market. The banks are allowed to keep on their books the value of those assets until and unless they sell them. And this is what happened once again at Silicon Valley Bank. They didn't, they had assets, and they, but they had more liabilities than they had assets because they may have bought, let's say $10 billion of US treasuries, but because they had to sell them quick, they only got $6 billion for them. So they had an immediate $4 billion loss. And that's what's happening today at every bank in the US. So remember the whole banking system, $2.1 trillion, that's their value, but they have unrealized losses on their balance sheet of 1.7 trillion. The difference, $400 billion. That's the only thing standing between us and a repeat of the Great Recession or Great Depression, actually, in the 1930s when everybody was on soup lines. 400, 
billion dollars, which is nothing because just to solve the problem two weekends ago, the U.S. government printed or the Fed printed three hundred billion dollars to solve that problem. So you know we have we're that close to as, a, as an economy going upside down. The Fed is insistent on pushing their issue of making sure we bring inflation from up here down here at all costs. The rest of the market, the rest of the economy is betting that they won't play chicken. They've got this revolver to their own head, which is to our head, and they're threatening to pull it. And the stock market, all the investors out there saying, go ahead, do it, because we're all going to be screwed when that happens. So I think there's going to have to be something done with the Fed. I think they're going to have to make a big reverse course sometime in the next four months. They, they insisted after they raised the rate 25 basis points last week that they were going to continue to raise. I don't think they're going to be able to. I think they're going to have to uh, at least flatten it, if not go down, because that will turn the economy from a free fall at least to a leveling off and maybe going back up. And that's what we have to have right now. We need, we need growth. We don't need the economy for $400 billion going upside down where every bank is broke because the U.S. government can't print that $10 trillion shortage or the $7 trillion shortage. They can't print that much money. It's not, I mean, physically, could they do it? Yeah, but it would mean a McDonald's, a dollar value meal would go from a dollar to $6. And it would be like that across the board. Everything would be hyperinflated. You'd have 100% per month inflation or more. Uh, money essentially would be worthless. It would be going back to the, the Wehrmacht era of the 1920s in Germany where they were, you see these pictures of them, but literally the Germans going through the streets of Munich hold, carrying barrels of cash of German Deutschmarks in order to buy one loaf of bread. And that's how that economy was, and that's what brought Hitler to power. And I'm not saying that that would happen in this country, but we are that close to that much stupidity. So for those of you who have the temerity and the wherewithal to contact your congressman, put pressure on them. U.S. senators for your state, put pressure on them. Any elected representative, put pressure on them and say, no, we want interest rates brought down. Now, because the rest of the market out there, the stockbrokers, the stock market, you know, all the money people, all of the hedge fund managers, because everybody's putting so much pressure and nobody believes that the Fed's going to actually pull the gun and, and shoot themselves, the short-term interest rates, in other words, the three to six month the one year, the two year, and even the 10 year numbers have dropped a lot. So in other words, money is cheaper, even though the Fed raised their discount rate, the, the rest of the money supply and the, the bases upon which mortgages are built, which is primarily the 10 year T-bill has come down and it's come down 75 basis points in the last couple of weeks. So that's gonna make mortgages cheaper. It's gonna make our business a lot better in the short term. And I think you're gonna see a rush to safety, safety, in this type of Mad Max potential environmental conditions is things like gold, uh, potentially crypto, uh, gold and silver, by the way, uh, commodities and housing. Uh, housing will be one of those safe places. I think you're going to see more people flock to housing, even though there's not enough houses out there available to this stuff. That's, I, that could keep prices flat or maybe even increase at a short period of time. I know it sounds counterintuitive to where we should be in this economic cycle, but this is a, you know, this is a, a, a roadrunner and coyote situation. And the coyote is the Fed and the rest of us are the roadrunner. And so far we're escaping everything. So we'll see, we'll let you know what happens. Uh, it is a, in my opinion, a fairly dire situation. Uh, but I think the housing industry has the ability to come through this as one of the four places uh, that will do better in a recessionary environment or a complete collapse of the banking system. It will definitely be something of value. I'd sure as heck rather have a house than you know shares in a high tech company where they're laying off a lot of employees right now. The house has still got some value. People have to live. All right, that's it for news you can use for today. Sorry, it was all bad news, but it's actually good news when you dig deep uh, and look at the kernel that is housing. It's a, a good place to be. Okay, thank you for watching. If you get a minute, I would love to hear your comments about what you think of these videos. Feel free also to put in any topics down here in the comment section, things that you'd like to hear me discuss. Any questions you want, go ahead and put in here. 
We'll make sure we get a video on it when we get time. And as always, please like and subscribe. Hit that ring the bell button as well to get notified every time there is a new video. Thanks a lot, everybody.